Five years ago, a massive earthquake and tsunami devastated Japan's northeast. Communities along the coast were washed away, and the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant experienced a triple meltdown. In Tokyo, people gathered for a national memorial ceremony to mark the day when so many lives were changed forever. Some 1,200 people took part in the event. They observed a moment of silence at 2.46 p.m., the exact time the quake hit. Mokuto. The attendees paid tribute to the nearly 16,000 people who died. More than 2,500 others are still missing. Several people who lost loved ones told their stories. Kuniyuki Sakuma spoke to families like his that lived near the nuclear plant being divided and scattered. We are seized with anxieties and uncertainties that are beyond words. We wonder, when will we be able to return to our homes? Will a day come when our families are united again? Sakuma described how his father died in temporary housing in a snowy place far from home. He vowed to help rebuild the devastated communities. Hisato Yamamoto was 17 when the disaster hit. Her grandfather's body was found a few days later. Her father rushed to the coast to close the floodgate ahead of the tsunami and never came home. She now looks back at that decision with pride. The sense of loss and pain after the great earthquake was heavy. But conversely, it has also given me the strength to grow up. Engraving my father's efforts to protect the people from the tsunami deep in my heart, I have come to believe that my filial duty to my father is to walk forward, doing my utmost to be of service to other people. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe vowed to continue efforts to revitalize the devastated region. Safe. Once again, I would like to make a firm pledge here that the government will exert its unified efforts to build a strong and resilient nation that is resistant to disasters. Emperor Akihito said he's concerned that there may be many people whose suffering is still unknown to others. <laughs> As the ceremony drew to a close, people made offerings at an altar in memory of the victims. The head of Japan's nuclear regulator has told his staff to keep trying to ease the concerns of people in regions affected by the accident. Nuclear Regulation Authority Chairman Shuichi Tanaka says there are many things people working for the NRA can do. He says residents in affected areas are worried about radiation exposure. We have to make every effort to dismantle the Fukushima Daiichi plant to avoid causing residents further concern. The NRA was set up after two government regulatory bodies failed to prevent Japan's worst nuclear accident. Tanaka says all those working for the authority must fine-tune inspection procedures and improve their skills to meet the expectations of the public. On March 11, 2011, a massive earthquake hit northeastern Japan. It triggered a huge tsunami and caused one of the worst nuclear accidents in history at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. In this installment of our series, Journey from Disaster, we take an in-depth look at efforts to respond to the nuclear disaster. Workers and engineers are facing a broad range of challenges as they begin the lengthy process of decommissioning the plant. Five years after the accident, inspection of the reactors has just begun. We'll take a look at the situation now. Last October, Tokyo Electric Power Company showed images of the inside of Reactor 3's containment vessel for the first time since the disaster. 
Engineers sent remote-controlled cameras into the vessel. They detected radiation strong enough to kill a human in about six hours. It caused the dots and lines in these pictures. The images show that the cast iron floor is heavily rusted from long exposure to water used for cooling. But workers had to abandon attempts to view the bottom of the vessel. The water was too dirty. The 2011 tsunami and earthquake knocked out the plant's cooling system. As the reactor fuel rods heated to over 2,000 degrees Celsius, they began to melt. Three reactors at the site went into meltdown. Hydrogen explosions followed. The blasts at three reactor buildings discharged radioactive materials across wide areas of northeastern Japan. Five years later, TEPCO engineers are still struggling to find where and how the melted fuel is located. They assume it has melted through the core and fallen to the bottom of the containment vessels. But no one really knows. TEPCO set up a company to take charge of decommissioning the plant. The man at the top is aware of his responsibility. We must be careful about radiation exposure for everybody, those who work at the plant as well as local residents. We must carry out this decommissioning work to decrease the risk of exposure. He says the most important part of the process is collecting data on the melted fuel. Finding out where the melted fuel is is important. We have to remove it or the process will never finish. We need to find out where it is. Then we can develop a method to remove it. While TEPCO struggles to deal with the reactors, local residents face their own challenges. Radiation levels around the plant remain extremely high. No one is allowed to enter the areas marked in red. People can enter the yellow areas during the day, but they can't stay overnight. 100,000 people are still unable to return to their homes. Many people lost their hometown in an instant, and they are struggling to rebuild their lives. It's not only material things I lost. I lost my future, too. My job and my livelihood were taken away. On March 11, 2011, the massive earthquake and tsunami that hit northeastern Japan triggered a triple meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. It was one of the worst nuclear accidents in history. Decommissioning work at the plant has not proceeded smoothly. High levels of radiation have hampered the efforts of workers. Nuclear engineers are developing robots to help, but even with advanced technology, they still have a long and difficult road ahead. NHK World's Yoshihito Kametani reports. A tube-shaped device emerges from a narrow passage. It's a robot designed to probe the highly radioactive interior of the containment vessel, especially in very tight areas. The robot can change shape. A light on its back casts a bright glow, so its camera can capture sharp images. Even now, workers can only stay inside crip reactor buildings for a few minutes. Therefore, robots are essential. But high levels of radiation hinder their ability to do their job. So engineers are hard at work on robots that can speed up the contamination, particularly of the concrete structures, where toxic substances are deeply embedded. They've developed this device, which can scrub beneath the surface by bombarding it with iron particles. 
engineers guide the device using computer images. The robot can be broken down into its component parts to make it easier to move. I hope the robot will be deployed in many situations at the plant. I hope the decommissioning process will move as quickly as possible. The government is building a robotic technology research center in Fukushima. It will cost about $100 million. Officials want to create a broad array of new robots. We have developed robots to solve many problems, but now it's time to consider new models to deal with the 40-year decommissioning process. But as helpful as robots might be, there are still some tasks for which only human workers are qualified. To protect them, engineers have started developing a robotic suit. It's equipped with heavy shielding to reduce exposure to radiation. The shielding is made of lead and a special material. It weighs about 60 kilograms. Equipment attached to each leg supports the weight. When the wearer moves, a computer detects the weight of the legs and the motorized system supports the walking movements. But the suit only shields against 40% of the radiation and engineers have admitted that many hurdles still lie ahead. When we deploy a robot or repair it, people have to go inside the building. We need a human touch. Many tasks require it, and that number has been increasing. We have to reduce human exposure to radiation. The decommissioning work at the Fukushima plant will be filled with hidden obstacles. But engineers will continue their struggle to make it as safe as possible. Yoshihito Kamitani, NHK. A top UN official says he hopes the international community will benefit from Japan's experience of earthquakes and tsunami. Robert Glasser, the special representative of the UN Secretary General for Disaster Risk Reduction, spoke to NHK after Nat National Memorial Service in Tokyo. This is such, a, such an amazing, amazingly competent, intelligent, technologically advanced society that is living in such a dangerous place with so many disasters, whether it's earthquakes, tsunamis. Japan is almost uniquely position to do that, to play that role. Glasser said Japan's 2011 earthquake, tsunami and nuclear meltdowns raised global awareness of natural disasters. He said people should recognize the Fukushima nuclear crisis as an opportunity to make improvements. UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon also extended his condolences to the victims. He said Japan has shown the world importance, the importance of learning from past calamities so as to prepare for future disasters. The Japanese embassy in Washington has posted an online video message to thank the U.S. for its support following the March 2011 disaster. About 20,000 U.S. soldiers and 20 vessels took part in Operation Tomodachi, the largest ever U.S. military relief operation. Americans also sent donations and encouraging messages to survivors of the disaster. Japanese diplomats and embassy staff expressed their gratitude. March 11, 2011 was a terrible moment for our country. Immediately after the great earthquake, Americans responded with incredible generosity. With your help, we have continued to rebuild. The affected areas are recovering. Please come visit. The commander of U.S. forces in Japan, Lieutenant General John Dolan, also posted an online statement. Dolan said the world will long remember the courage, strength, and perseverance of the Japanese people in the aftermath of the disaster. He said the unprecedented operation was carried out in the spirit of friendship. Dolan said the two countries will continue to share and keep a solemn obligation to remember the victims and everyone who continues to help rebuild the devastated areas. 
Now, people who once lived near the Fukushima nuclear plant are now only allowed to return to their homes during the day. And one former resident has been paying regular visits to care for the land he loves. These splendid-looking specimens were grown by Shigeru Nietzuma. He started farming in Okuma, the home of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, nearly half a century ago. Three years after the disaster, the national government finished replacing the contaminated agricultural soil. Nietzuma has been growing vegetables for research purposes since last summer. The prefecture wants to measure their radioactivity to determine their safety. This is my broccoli. It's in season right now. All the vegetables' radioactivity has been within the national standard. Even so, there's no prospect of restrictions being lifted any time soon. Food from the area is regulated by an array of laws. I want to grow all kinds of vegetables and collect data so I can get permission to distribute them again. The nuclear disaster ravaged Niyatsuma's farm. Eventually, he hopes to restore the farm. It's been in his family for generations. Several times a week, he commutes from his temporary housing unit in a neighboring prefecture to cultivate the land. But farming hereafter is not at all the same. These fields were decontaminated. There's still a lot of sand. Decontamination reduced radiation levels at the cost of replacing fertile soil with sand and red clay. Returning to full-scale farming will require restoring the soil to its former quality. Niyatsuma is growing rye, not to eat, but rather to mix into the soil as fertilizer. It's all about the soil. I have to come here often and take care of the land to improve the quality of the soil as much as possible. Persevere he has, and his crops are making a comeback. White cabbage is 7.7 .7 becquerel. The other cabbage seems okay, too. All of the produce had radiation levels within the national standard. But selling or distributing it is illegal, so he had to destroy everything. I'm sad. It's really heartbreaking. If I could, I would share these fresh vegetables with my neighbors and we'd eat them together, but I can't. For now, all he can do is return them to the soil as fertilizer for future crops. I hope to produce good vegetables when I come back, though I don't know when that will be. Things are tough right now. I have to overcome this if I want to keep the farm going for my family. If future generations do get the opportunity to work this land again, they'll have the custodian of the current generation to thank.